All right. Uh, good evening. It is now 7 o'clock. We'll call this meeting to order. Um, roll call will show that four board members are present. Uh, board member Joe Crepito is actually attending his son's graduation, so he is excused this evening. Um, has this meeting been posted, Dr. Medzik? Yes, it has. Okay. Uh, let us begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, first on our list tonight is communications. Dr. Midzik? Yes. School safety is a matter always on our minds as parents, educators, and administrators. School must and should be a place where students feel completely safe and secure. Greendale Schools has systems in place to ensure our students and staff are physically and emotionally safe at school. We work regularly with the Greendale Police and Fire Departments, Milwaukee County Emergency Services, and other law enforcement to review our practices regarding school safety. Following the school shooting tragedy in Uvalde, Texas, I was personally in contact with Chief Rosenau, who, with his officers, have provided additional police presence and patrols around our schools in the past weeks. The district is working closely with the village board and the police chief to provide additional safety training in our schools this summer. The district safety coordinator, in collaboration with Greendale Police, will review school safety needs and develop plans to foster relationships between students and law enforcement. Annually, the board reviews and approves a school safety plan, with the most recent plan approved in November of 2021. In preparation for this plan review, the police and the fire departments conduct safety assessment walkthroughs with members of the school safety team. A proactive response is the best strategy to maintain safety, and this is highlighted in the school safety plan approved by the board. A week and a half ago, the proactive efforts manifested in students reporting information about a rumor circulating that another student had a weapon stored in their vehicle. Administration investigated and conducted a search which turned up empty. In this case, there was not a threat to school safety, and the proactive reporting allowed the Greendale schools to verify safety. At the village board meeting tomorrow, there are agenda items related to school safety. Mr. Lotus, as the school safety coordinator, and I have worked with the police chief, the village manager, and the village president regarding the school's input on these topics. Greendale Schools is partnering with Panorama Education to gather feedback from our 6th through 12th grade students and families by piloting a nationally normed survey. Students completed the surveys at school and families received emails directly from Panorama. Surveys are an important way for the district to celebrate successes and determine areas for growth. The survey report will be shared with the district and community once it's compiled and that survey closes uh, at the end of this week. Greendale High School has been recognized as a 21-22 Project Lead the Way Distinguished School. It is one of just 190 high schools across the U.S. to receive this honor for providing broad access to transformative learning experiences for students through Project Lead the Way Computer Science, Biomedical Science, and Engineering. Project Lead the Way is a nonprofit organization that serves over that serves millions of pre-K through 12 students and teachers in over 12,000 schools across the U.S. The Project Lead the Way Distinguished School Recognition honors schools committed to increasing student access, engagement, and achievement in Project Lead the Way programs. There are new Why I Teach videos available for public viewing on the district YouTube channel. This video series highlights the work of the outstanding teachers and staff in our district. I encourage everyone to watch and join us in celebrating all of our amazing educators. We are pleased to congratulate the 2022 CAP Adjunct of the Year. CAP is the uh, college credit opportunities through Greendale High School at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Julie Hom has been named uh, the CAP Adjunct of the Year. Ms. Hom is a science teacher and environmental science adjunct at Greendale High School. Last month, the board also recognized Ms. Hom for being named the 2022 Cole Fellow. Greenell High School will graduate more than 240 students at commencement this Saturday, June 11th at 11 a.m. The ceremony will be held at Gavinsky Stadium and is also live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. Congratulations to our newest GHS alumni and their families, and I'd like to thank Paris Wooden, who will be leaving us. This is her last meeting tonight, so we thank her for her, um, her service on the board and her time uh, leading at Greendale High School. And on Thursday, we will also be celebrating eighth grade promotion uh, for Greendale Middle School, and that will also occur on Gavinsky Field on Thursday. 
The Park and Recreation Department received 300 in an anonymous donation to be used for general purposes. Another donation of $217.99 was received from Step Up to Better Health to support hall work walkers in our program. We appreciate the funding and the support. And at this time, I'd like to request that the board reorder the agenda so that we can approve the new student board member uh, before citizen comments. Sure. So uh, um, for a motion? Yep. I'll move that we reorder the agenda for action item eight uh, to be moved up and uh, ahead of ac uh, agenda item three. Oh, no. Excuse me. Agenda item four. Because comments from visitors should come first, right? So you I'll can, I'll, I'll restate put it that. Or comments, if you'd like. You want to do? Oh, okay, comments? okay, sure. I'll leave it then. I need a second. Okay. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to reorder the agenda. Uh, let's take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes. So motion passes. I just wanted to make a quick comment, um, just on behalf. I'm going to speak uh, not just on behalf of the board, but um, thanking Dr. Midzik and the administrative team. Um, for their due diligence in light of um, what happened in Uvalde and Uvalde, Texas. I want to uh, just say that our hearts go out and our thoughts and prayers to the families. Uh, but I really am appreciative for the work that our district is doing with the safety plan and had the nice opportunity to meet with the uh, village president and village manager this last week. And we do take safety seriously. So I appreciate you highlighting that tonight. Um, so we are going to um, now. Uh, take um, action, right? For yes. So the the um, high school put out uh, an opportunity for all of the class of 2024 to apply to be the student board representative for the school board. Uh, Paris has served as the school board representative for the class of 22. Wes continues to serve for the class of 23. He is at training this evening and may join us late. Um, and so we put out an opportunity for the class of 2024 to apply to be a student board representative. Uh, we conducted interviews. Uh, the interview team included uh, Wes as the 2023 student representative, uh, Mr. Cropito as the president at the time, uh, Mr. Lotus and myself. Um, so we interviewed a number of students and selected Kaya Fuentes to serve as the class representative for the class of 2024. And so I recommend your approval. All right. Okay, I'll make a motion to wholeheartedly approve uh, Kaya Fuentes as our new student board member. I second. We have a second. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second to approve Kaya Fuentes as our new student board member. And we'll start with a roll call. Yes. 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 And I'm yes. And congratulations. Let's <laughs> give her a hand. Would you like to say anything? You don't have to. It's just an opportunity. You just have, you to, just have to push the button. OK, there. Yep. I just want to say thank you. Um, it's, I think it's a perfect opportunity for me just to help out our school as a whole. and. That's just why I want to do it in general. And so I hope that these next two years are I'm able to do that with all of you. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you. We're looking forward to working with you, too. All right. Um, so now we are moving on to agenda item three, which is comments and questions from visitors. Um, and uh, I'll be calling people up in a moment for that. Um, we do have a little statement. Uh, we're just going to welcome to all that will be speaking this evening. We'd like to remind you that school board meetings are for the purpose of carrying on the business of the district. They are official business meetings held in public. Through, po board, uh, through school board policy 186, the board allows citizens to make comments by scheduling two opportunities on the agenda to receive citizen comments. In accordance with the intent of the open meetings law, please be aware that although the Board of Education welcomes comments from the public, it cannot discuss or debate items brought up during the public comments. In order to hear from all citizens who wish to speak and to ensure that the official business of the district is addressed, board policy sets a time limit for citizen comments. We will be adhering to that board policy and its time limits at tonight's meeting. Persons wishing to address the board are asked to come to the podium and state their name and address for the record. Comments are limited to only one time. Individuals who will be speaking will be limited to three minutes. Citizen comments are limited to a period not to exceed 30 minutes. Thank you. So do we have anyone that would like to speak tonight?
Good evening, Heather. Good evening. Uh, my name is Heather Godley, and I live at 5331 Millbank Road in Greendale. And I'm here tonight representing the board of Page Advo uh, of uh, people advocating for Greendale equity. And I just wanted to address a policy that um, the policy committee is, is uh, discussing right now. I think probably you'll have a chance to um, have a reading of it next time. Um, and just wanted to make sure that, uh, that we kind of had some common understandings of, uh, of what Page thinks is really important with this uh, policy. Page believes that it is essential that educators should be able to have freedom of expression on social media. This is especially critical for teachers who are speaking out to support their students who might face difficulty at school related to gender and racial issues. We know that in some districts, board members and administrators have used social media policies to prevent staff from sharing posts about Black Lives Matter, Pride Month, and other issues of human rights, and we hope that this is not something that Greendale will try to use this policy to do. It is essential that a social media policy should not be used to persecute normal expression that may differ from board members or administrators' political views, but rather ensure that teachers are being allowed free speech, especially in areas that directly affect their uh, students' well-being, as well as having you know their own rights to uh, express themselves in our democracy. As you consider this policy in upcoming weeks, please consider ad adding further safeguards to ensure that any social media policy is used judiciously and applied neutrally, uh, and reiterate that board members and administration should never use their personal beliefs as the criteria by which this policy is applied. Page supports Greendale educators and their freedom of expression and invites any teacher or staff member to contact us directly if they feel that this policy is being poorly applied now um, or in the future when a new policy is adopted or used to deter, teachers, uh, to deter teachers from speaking out on social media about issues that are important to them, especially as they relate to equity. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And um, that uh, policy will be discussed this evening, so I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, any other comments from the audience tonight? Okay, seeing none, we are going to move on to action item number four, which is the approval of the regular meeting minutes from May 16th. So I don't know if there's any discussion on them first, or if not, I'm looking for a motion to approve. Um, I make a motion to approve um, the regular meeting minutes of May 16th, 2022. I'll second. So we have a motion and a second to approve the board meeting minutes. Any further discussion? Then I will ask for a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes, so motion passes. Next on our agenda, we have three items we received uh, in our board packet uh, for personnel. And we'll be taking those all together tonight, unless anybody ha sees otherwise. Um, uh, so I don't think there's any, uh, is there any discussion that anyone has on the personnel questions? If not, I'm looking for a motion to approve our personnel. I will move to approve uh, agenda item five, approving the middle school principal reassignment request, accepting a speech pathologist resignation request, and approving a full-time social worker appointment. I'll second. So we have a motion and a second to approve the personnel. I would like to just make one comment, um, and that would be uh, to thank Mr. Weiss for his uh, many years of service as a, an administrator in the district, and I'm very happy to hear he's gonna be continuing on in our classrooms. So with that being said, I'll take a roll call. Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes. And I'm yes, motion passes. Uh, item number six is an action item on the approval of the Southeastern Wisconsin School Alliance Resolution and Agreement, or otherwise known as the S WSA 2020 to 2021 Annual Report. So I don't know if there's any comments on that, uh, Dr. Mizek. Nope, this is an annual action item, and yep. I believe you've been attending the meeting, so if I there's have anything additional. Yep, we will be having a new executive director starting, I believe, in July. But um, if there's not any questions, I'm looking for a motion. Uh, I will move approval of action item six, approving the Southeastern Wisconsin School Alliance Resolution and Agreement, also known as SWSA. I'll second. 
Got a motion and a second to approve. Any further discussion? If not, I'm looking for a roll call. Yes. 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 And I'm yes. Motion passes. Uh, agenda item seven is the approval of our independent hearing officer resolution. Um, this is, I believe, an annual approval, Dr. Midzik? Yes, this is an annual approval. Um, there is no cost unless you use services. So the board policy is that there are certain um, actions that would normally come to the board for a hearing, um, things like uh, student expulsion from school, which we haven't had. Um, but in the event that you would, the, typically the board would hear that expulsion hearing and make a decision and it would be open to the public. The board has elected to um, employ an independent hearing officer with expertise in the law on these cases and the board would still be required to take action but the hearing would occur with this independent hearing officer um, who would pass along their recommendation to the board and the board would take action on that independent hearing officer's recommendation. So the agreement approval essentially is approving a retainer with the independent hearing officer and should we require services then I would contact her to um, engage and it would be at the rate that we agree to on this. But if we don't use the services we pay zero dollars. Okay. Are there any questions about that? This is probably new to our new board members. Any questions? In my time on the board, I think we have used the independent hearing officer one time in the five years I've served. So, okay. If there are no further, dis or if there is no further discussion, I'm looking for a motion to approve the independent hearing officer resolution. Okay, I make a motion to approve the independent hearing officer resolution. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve the independent hearing officer resolution. Any further discussion? If not, let's take a roll call. Yes. 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 And I'm yes. Motion passes. Item number eight is also an action item, uh, the approval of the two. We already approved it. Oh, that's you right. reordered. You My bad. So we're on nine. I have two agendas here, and I have the wrong one in front of me. Okay, next item is an informational item on the budget amendments for 2021-22. This is a review. Yes, this is an, uh, an annual process for the budget, and I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan to walk you through it. Uh, it is something that you will have to take action on on June 20th, but you have opportunity to review it tonight. Thank you. So on the attachment that was included with the background document, we laid out those areas where there were budget changes for the 21-22 school year. Some of these are typical. When we look at the library aid item, that doesn't get finalized until early spring. And so we work off of an estimate and we hold back a certain percentage of that total budget until we know the final dollar figure and then adjust so that we can spend down those funds. The three other areas on the revenue side, one is the ARPA funding. So that was one time federal stimulus money to schools. And in total, there was $134 per student that was allocated. So the district apportioned a, por a part of that, um, waiting for the final allocation, which came in winter. And then once we get the final allocation, we reallocated that to the curriculum area. So when you look at the expense side, we've reassigned those dollars to utilize them as one-time funding. Since this was a one-time allocation, we weren't able to utilize this for ongoing recurring expenditures. So we had to be careful about which expenses we could tie to this. But besides that, it had very few limitations. It was a way to provide revenues, spendable revenues for districts in this year that could be utilized to sustain programming. Then the other two areas we talk about frequently at the board level, so our SR2 and SR3 funding, and that just reflects the changes that have gone on with the grant as the year has progressed. And so we'll remember the SR3 grant, we weren't able to actually submit the budget for that until December of last year, so that was after the original budget had been approved. So this matches what we expect for expenditures through June 30th, and then dollars that we have remaining will continue on based on those end dates within the program. So there were three rounds of ESSER. One is ending in September of this year, and we fully expended those funds. The second round goes through September of 23, and we project that we will not have an issue 
spending down those funds. And then the final is in September of 24 for ESSER 3. And we plan to have most all of those funds spent, if not entirely, by June of next year. Okay. So looking for any questions that the board would have regarding those. Otherwise, we will bring this back at the next board meeting for approval. Okay. Any questions anyone have? I had mine answered before. You had it <laughs> answered. All right. Um, did you say 134 per student for the ARPA? Or yes, that, that was the total amount. Total amount. Yes. Okay. All right. Nothing further. All right. Then we're moving on to agenda item 10, which is the curriculum cycle K-12 character education, physical education and health, and the 6-8 science as well as face. So the um, the district takes uh, curriculum into consideration on a cyclical process in order to allocate funding appropriately and be able to re refresh and renew curricular resources um, on an annual basis. We couldn't replace them all at once and then uh, not have a process for that. So um, this year in the cycle, physical education and health were in the cycle, FACE was in the cycle, um, middle school science was uh, in the cycle last year, but they needed an extra year to finalize some decisions. And then character education has uh, been brought forward as a refresh. It did go longer than six years since the last um, adoption, uh, but we are it brought it into the cycle this year. So I'm going to turn it over to Maggie Olson and team to share some information on the process and what they are recommending. All right. So um, thank you. One of the things that um, I heard kind of loud and clear from the board and from the community is they wanted an overview of the curriculum review process. So I'm going to start with our um, instructional non-negotiables. Next slide, please. So these are our three instructional non-negotiables that we are really grounded in as a district. One is that our instruction is aligned to grade level standards. And our, we have standards that the board approves every August and that every different content area has standards and our instruction must be aligned to those standards. The second is that we have assessments that align to those grade level standards and that we're assessing how students are doing on those standards, where they can grow, how we can adjust our instruction, how we can ensure that all of our students are having access to that grade level rigor and instruction. And then lastly, um, that our teachers have opportunities to reteach if there are students who aren't mastering those grade level standards. So really, it's a cycle of here's the curriculum, our, let's assess. An assessment doesn't always look like pen and paper. Sometimes it can, be, it can be playing a musical instrument. It can be a project. It can be showing what you know in a different way. And if kids aren't understanding that, then we want to reteach that skill or standard. So um, when we're thinking about curriculum review, those standards and instructional for all are in the center of this work. And then we're looking at best practices and research and seeing what the, because in six years in education, things change. There's newer research. They are always looking and doing research to ensure that um, our kids are getting the best outcomes they need. So we need to respond to that research and see, and also, Things change in with kids. Kids change. Teachers change. So we need to make sure that we're changing with the most recent um, research. Also, we're look. Oh, go back. Thank you. We're also looking at student outcomes, and that really looks at um, the readiness, the readiness um, factors that we've talked about before: um, graduation rates, um, GPA, um, summative achievement scores, all of those different factors and how our students are performing on um, on the standards and through the curriculum. And so we're looking at that through the curriculum review. And then another huge part of this is teacher voice. 
Um, we want to make sure that our teachers, um, they pilot different curriculums, they get to touch the materials, they have student surveys that they give to say how did this go, they look at the outcomes that students had because we want to make sure that the money that we're allocating towards these resources are used by our teachers so their voice is very important as well. So those are the three things we're really looking at that really get to um, the standards when we're looking at curriculum review. Next slide. And then the Department of Public Instruction, they really think about it as an ongoing cycle, exactly what Dr. Amidjits was speaking to, was that we're always looking at this. So the first year is really looking at the standards. The second year is really looking at that curriculum and saying, okay, what is going to be best for our kids? And that's exactly what we did with science last year with middle school. We really dug deep into the science standards. And now we piloted, looked at curriculum, and said this is what we want to do. And then years three, four, five, and before we go through this cycle again, we'll be looking at the assessments and the instruction and how things are doing for our students. Um, next slide, please. And we also just want to make sure that we are keeping equity at the forefront of this and that we're selecting high quality standard aligned materials um, that are really representative of our student body and all students, um, not just the middle, not just the high, not just kids who are struggling learners, but all of our kids uh, and ensuring that um, we're always trying to continually improve and then giving our teachers those opportunities for professional development to also hone um, their skills to give the curriculum and adjust the curriculum. Next slide. So in the curriculum review, there are many different activities that um, we go through in a year. So we start with an environmental scan and research and think about who else is using different best practices throughout um, not only our section of the world, but throughout the country and seeing what other um, school districts are using. And then we're really trying to develop a scope and sequence. And then we're really getting our hands on those curricular resources. And we are looking at piloting. And, and some of you might have received a note saying, we're piloting this curriculum. And um, so just so you know, your kids might be doing something a little different. So we let families know that. And then teachers actually get to try out that new curriculum and then we meet and we say what worked, what didn't work, what were some of the struggles, what were some of the gaps that were maybe filled that we didn't have last time. So that's um, really part of that review process from the December to March. And then um, kind of moving from there, we start finalizing things and looking at units and focusing on skills and making sure that our teachers have everything they need to be successful with this curriculum review. And then I come here and present it to you all. So that's kind of the, um, that is the different activities that we're doing. Um, and this year, we are looking at six through eight science. Um, there's some math updates. Um, we're looking at family consumer ed, physical education, and social emotional learning and character ed. And next year, we'll be looking at, e oh, go back. Thank you. Next year, we'll be looking at English language arts, which is reading, writing, and speaking. And then the year after that, we'll be looking at social studies and business. And then the year after that, music and art. <coughs> Excuse me and then math, and then it'll go back to science um, in 26, 27. So that's how the cycles continue, and we kind of just keep adding and then reframing and looking at um, those different um, components. So are there any questions about that before I move on to the different curricular um, review areas for this cycle? I have a, a couple questions. Yeah. Thank you. By the way, it was very uh, I, well laid out. I think especially for people who aren't in education, it is sort of the mystery of um, they wonder, how, how do we arrive at these decisions? So uh, when you're talking about standards, um, another word maybe for a layperson would be expectations. So there's certain ex things that every second grader should should know in science or every fifth grader should know in English. So those standards have been set. And then there's all kinds of curriculums out there that would love 
us, you know, would love our business. <laughs> so that's why we have to review the curriculum and use the teacher voice and some research and especially the outcomes, right? We really want to see if the curriculum that we're using um, is working. Are the, are the students successful um, with the curriculum? So I just want to add that summary. Um, can you, could you, um, oh shoot, I was talking so long I forgot my question. <laughs> I'll have, pause, I'll let. <laughs> I have a question. So what you, what you just stated, you talked about the standards. So maybe just explain how the standards are determined. Is it, because I think a lot of it's based on what the state did That's exactly know, correct. Like yeah. Teachers are making up the standards. No, so there is a huge um, a group of people that every they have a similar cycle at the Department of Public Instruction where they are looking at the different standards that our students or expectations that our students have to be able to mask our goal is for them to be able to do these certain specific skills or activities by the time they finish second grade or by the time they finish algebra or by the time they finish geometry um, so they have educators throughout the state that work there they work with um, uh, curricular um, specialists that focus on each different curricular area to ensure that they're getting they're using the most recent research and also getting that teacher voice too it's very similar to our process but more of at a statewide process sure and then we I remembered sorry uh, so we don't every six years we don't automatically change curriculums correct no, there's been many times where um, actually we have in our curriculum for 6-8 uh, science that's coming up next, we're um, doing a little bit of a revision, but we're continuing on with the same curriculum. And we'll speak to why we decided that. Right. So, I mean, obviously, as anyone can imagine, the curriculum is the heart of what we do. So every six years to take the time to review it under these detailed lenses um, is you know the work of any school district so and I just want to also say that like the curriculum guides our teachers um, but there is no like magic curriculum because then everyone would just use that curriculum and say oh it's great we just use this curriculum and then everyone will learn yeah. it's the magic that our amazing teachers in Greendale um, work with our students on and the the school the strategies and tools they use to ensure that all of our kids have access and have great outcomes that's where the real um, you know rubber hits the road but the curriculum is an important piece of that as well I was going to just ask because curriculum sometimes gets intertwined with textbook. Um, so when we're talking here curriculum, we're talking the overall um, scope and sequence of what we're learning, whereas textbook adoption may or may not be something we do every six years. Yeah, so and that's something that can... Um, as we move to a more digital world, um, there isn't so much, this is the textbook for social studies that we're all going to work. There's many different... Um, there's many different sources that we might use. Like currently, we use um, News ELA, which has current events, and that's on the computer, and that's not a textbook, but it's a, a subscription we have that allows us to um, have current events that's been um, vetted by us and have that opportunity. So that's one example. Or we have teachers who make a scope and sequence using novels, like for um, English at the high school level. So there are many different ways to look at that as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. and, and I was gonna say too, the new ZLA that you highlighted, it, what's really nice is they actually have it leveled for readers. So if Lots of different access points, right, yeah. So if a student's struggling, you had mentioned something about uh, reteaching, and I think in Greendale we call it win or what I need. Um, can, can you just, do we not? Okay, okay, maybe I'm mistaken. No, there is, there, well, there is times for that, and we're trying to really think about where that happens in the That's class. That's what I was going to ask. Exactly. So I think there are times that it's happening organically in class, like we're doing groups, and hey, you come with me, you go there. That's happening often. There's also some days, like, there's review days where they're saying you need extension, you need remediation, you are right where you need to be. So those are um, teacher decisions often. And then there are some schools that are using that win time and using it to reteach to um, the kids who aren't um, mastering the standards yet or the expectations. And I, and I think that's really important you highlighted that because our, our goal as a district is to make sure no student is behind and so that we're taking those extra steps to 
get them caught up is really important. I shake my head just because the absence of wind time does not mean that they're not reteaching to mastery. That's sure. a, a time block. That's not a strategy. So gotcha. um, the <coughs> role of the board in the curriculum review process and part of the reason it's being presented this evening is you are, do, you are approving two things. You're approving um, the standards alignment with the scope and sequence to that standards alignment, and you're approving the purchase of resources to support that. Sometimes those resources are a textbook, sometimes those resources are something else. And so in tonight's presentation, you'll see both, um, and you'll see both uh, a standards alignment plan and a resource that would be purchased. And in many cases, and in the case of uh, the curriculums being presented tonight, um, the resources for uh, character education and the resources for science, the scope and sequence is contained within the resources. So th as you're listening tonight, your role as a board is to approve the standards, to approve the alignment to standards, and to approve the resources that may or may not include the scope and sequence. Thank you, Dr. Magnick, for clarifying that. I do have two more questions, though, that we've heard from the podium. Because as elected officials, we are, you know, another part of our role is to raise any concerns that come to us. When the outcomes are, are not ideal, then that's obviously a flag for adjusting curriculum, correct? Absolutely, yep. yep. And then another question um, regarding curriculum in general, uh, teachers have the standards that they're teaching to and they have the approved curriculum. Um, are they allowed to deviate from that? And if so, how far? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So. In our, we want to trust our teachers in making those decisions that if there is things that need to be um, extended or supported for a student, um, we give people that professional um, leeway. This is the scope and sequence, this is the curriculum. And if a kid needs something a little different, we want to ensure that they're able to get that so that they can get to those outcomes that you're speaking to. If the kids aren't doing that, we need to be able to have that flexibility. Um, and that's really important. Good question. I had a question in terms of the reteaching part as well. Um, personally, I'm so happy today was my last day of high school <laughs> curriculum. Um, <laughs> but there was definitely some times back in high school where I didn't quite understand a concept right away. And I did wish there was a teacher that was just like, it's OK, we can pull you aside and work on this for like another day, another two days, if you need another week. And I know there was lots of people that appreciated when I brought questions to the class, because they may have been confused too. But instead of speaking about it, they just moved on as if they like learned the content, but they didn't, and they have to continue on in the class. So it's not that they fell behind, but they decided not to learn the content and then move on, which was concerning to me because it's happened to me before. So my question is, with the reteaching process, how will a teacher ensure that a student can catch up to where they need to be, but also not to the point where they're overwhelmed with doing like double the work? Um, I know, like, I don't know if this has ever been considered, but it is an elective for a student to have a study hall. If a study hall would become somewhat mandatory for a student that may be struggling, or we talked about advisories earlier this um, past month about that flex time for students to come in and their teachers can request them. And I've, I've observed that, and I think some students are getting help that way, but just for the future, um, what exactly would that look like, say, if half the class is doing really well and then the rest of the half of the class is struggling? Well, and I think there's some there's a lot of things that you just brought up, and I really appreciate all of them, and I'm just going to speak quickly to them because I do want to continue on with this. And we are focusing a lot of our time this summer on how we are getting to those three non-negotiables, and reteaching is the tricky one. Like, where do we fit it in? How does it happen? What does that look like? And I think one is if half the class isn't getting it, we need to kind of think about what that is. If there's a couple kids that aren't, like maybe we needed to reteach that to the whole class if half of them aren't getting it. Um, Although if there are one or two, then thinking about that flex time and things like that. So I think there's some, uh, we need to, we're, we're working on those skills and those times and giving people permission to say, hey, it's not about how much we cover, it's how deep we cover and how much kids have understanding. And I think that's a shift in thinking sometimes because people are like, we need to get through all the things. And we know from research that it's better to go deeper and that kids actually, um, and this kind of goes to that embedded honors piece, like going deeper instead of 
more and faster, um, we're able to um, give more kids access um, and help our teachers give them that grace of, hey, this might not be working. Instead of saying like, hey, you're not on page 72 because we all need to be on page 72, we're more worried about ensuring that all of our kids are getting what they need. Does that kind of answer? Yes, thank okay. you. Um, I want to, I could talk about this all day, but we do have a couple of, um, we have a, 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 it's a big presentation today, so I just want to kind of get into the meat of it. Um, so before we move on, I just want you guys to look at your, because um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on two of the uh, curriculum reviews. One is the physical education. They just updated their um, standards. They did a great job. They met together, but there isn't an ask from a board from a financial standpoint at this time. So that is in your board packet. And then also Family Consumer Ed did a similar um, review of their standards and scope and sequence, and that's in the board report. Um, but they are also not asking for any um, materials at this time. So the one I want to focus on next is six through eight um, science curriculum review. So Maria, if you can move to the next slide. Thank you. Next one too. So um, it has been such a fun journey with the uh, middle school science team um, led with uh, Ms. Burrish, who's also here. Lee is here with us. She is the curriculum facilitator for uh, the middle school math department. And last, um, last year, we spent a lot of time looking at the Next Generation Science Standards, which is a national science standards, and trying to make sure that our middle school curriculum is aligned to those. Um, there was an update to their um, there wasn't the reason we also waited was there uh, there was an update to their cur current curriculum so we wanted to see if that new alignment would be more aligned in the newer curriculum with um, some of the assessments they were adding we also wanted to make sure that we are increasing instructions of science and engineering that was a gap we noticed in um, the science middle school science curriculum and then lastly making sure that we're really being stem focused in middle school so that they are prepared for high school next slide please so um, the next generation science standards is like I said a uh, national standards and it has been adopted by Wisconsin um, so we over last year, we worked with a DPI consultant to support us on in our middle school team on really digging deep into those standards and ensuring that we are meeting all of them. Um, and we were really happy to see after our work with that that the curriculum that we were using was hitting a lot of these standards. Um, <clears throat> the one, next slide please. The one area that we really were focused on was those science and engineering practices. And this is really a lot more of those hands-on type practices where we really want our um, middle schoolers to be scientists, where they're asking questions and they're developing models and they're investigating and they're using different math and computer thinking and really being able to um, get ready to be um, scientists in high school and really be excited about um, joining robotics or having those different opportunities in STEM in high school and after. So these are the different practices we wanted to see because the these were new since the last curriculum review. So when we, next slide. So when we were looking at um, iQuest, we um, wanted to see what we, and this was the current practice that they were using. So they were currently using iQuest, and in the new update, we kind of saw that there was an alignment to the next generation of um, science standards. There also was an improved representation of um, students of different backgrounds, really being showing um, more women in STEM, people of color in STEM. So we think that's really important as well. And um, it continues to be hands-on. That is why they picked it. Um, how many years ago, Lee, was it seven? Yeah, seven years ago was because of the labs, um, and that continues to be um, a strength of iQuest. Um, and then they have a really important new um, 
factor of um, the next generation science standards is making them phenomenon based where they'll look at a specific um, phenomenon in science and kind of dig into it through inquiry and then there's also connections to literacy which is always important because once you're in middle school you're reading to learn and then also um, making sure that there is um, that discourse that's really important for kids to understand in science so once we looked at that we piloted two different um, two different um, curriculums one was free and that was Open Syed. Um, and Open Syed had alignment to NGSS. It was also hands-on. It had units that included very similar um, things to iQuest. And it was free. So we were excited to look through that. It was not very laid out. It had a lot of open interpretation. So that was a, a challenge for the teachers and the students on how once we did some um, and we did some feedback sessions and we looked and we did a whole um, compare and contrast. We also looked at um, CPUP, which was another um, curriculum. And we, so they piloted Open Syed for a unit and they piloted um, CPUP for a unit. And after all of that, we came together and we looked at student outcomes, we looked at engagement, we looked at alignment, and what we decided as a team was that we were going to continue um, to use iQuest, but use Open Syed as a free source to support some of the gaps that we noticed in iQuest. So we noticed that iQuest had some gaps in engineering and designing. So we have already started, um, <coughs> excuse me, we have already started to implement those um, engineering design units into the scope and sequence for next year. So um, Open Syed is a really great um, resource for us and it is free for us to use so that with in partnership with iQuest is what we will be bringing to you for approval. Next slide. So these are just some awesome um, labs and Lee if you want to stand up and kind of explain real quick about what these different labs are. Maybe Paris or Kaya could. <laughs> Plus, I don't know if you were at the middle school so Kaya. if any of you the uh, top the top two pictures are actually something that you would have done at the at middle school in the physical education when you're learning about the different types of energy. You guys remember? Oh, labs? Kinetic energy. They're they're measuring um, the ma how mass affects kinetic energy and how speed affects kinetic energy in those top two pictures. And then in the bottom one, it's open Syed. The kids had to uh, design a heater. Uh, in case in an emergency situation they needed to heat up food. So they needed to figure out how much reactants they should have in order to create this ideal temperature, uh, which we surveyed, the kids surveyed the parents, how hot do they want their food? <laughs> and then based on the survey, they had to put the reactants together and uh, collect their data, analyze their data, and then they got to retest it to see if they um, got better results. So, Thank you. So what we are looking to purchase to support this instruction is in the board packet, but it would be a five-year um, re-up re of, um, of iQuest along with an assessment um, called ONPAR that would help with that reteaching and making sure that our kids are mastering the NGSS and they are aligned to that. So we're able to look at those assessments um, both in a formative way, which means that we're, that's education speak for, hey, like we're checking to see how you're doing today. It's not a final grade. So like, how are you doing today? What do I need to do to adjust my instruction to make sure you get it? And then also those summative pieces, which is like the end of the unit test to say, hey, how did they all do? And um, so that's also a new component to iQuest. Um, and we think that is going to be really helpful for the students at the middle school. So if you have any questions for um, Lee Burrish or me, we are happy to answer them regarding the science um, update. So uh, in the iQuest is a 612 curriculum? Or? No, 68. 
Just six eight. Okay, so we're just talking middle school. Right yeah, now. we approved last um, last year K five, and then also high school. Oh, I see. So middle school stands alone here tonight. Yeah, we took a little. We had an extra year on our contract with uh, Activate Learning, so we oh. decided that we would just take that time because we'd already paid for it. Sure. <laughs> so we might as well use it. Sure. But I really just cannot stress how much I really do. I'm a passionate teacher for iQuest. Okay. The seventh grade uh, you, lessons are just so, I think, fabulous. There's just, they're hands-on. The kids are actively engaged. I don't know, not every single day, but almost <laughs> very much. And I love how iQuest spirals that what we taught in September still being taught in they is yeah. all throughout the whole school year all the four units build on each other they come back um, and within each unit if you didn't get the first lesson it had every day coming that up again. lesson is talked about in all the preceding lessons so um, I really think that the kids leave with a good understanding of chemical reactions Remember that one, Paris? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, like, looking at those labs, I didn't remember anything. But then you said iQuest, and I remember some long nights on there. I was <laughs> like, they're really trying to make me a scientist right now. <laughs> 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 yeah, they well, get and pretty what's nice depth, about so. iQuest is um, the digital aspect because of the pandemic. They really stepped it up to help kids. You know, they don't have to read the lab they, I mean, even if you, you can't be there to do it, unfortunately, even I will still have the kids during that resource time come and do the lab. But in, when they're quarantined for so long or on an extended vacation or something, all the labs are recorded. And it's, they're watching what's happening. And they have to record the data. And they may have to try to make sense of it. So it's yeah. just Not an observation. I found so Serena, my middle, has you as her teacher, mm -hmm. and I did notice that the labs work. She could watch it and do all of her work, and I thought it was great. And not lose a beat. Not not they could come into class the next day or two days later, and you could watch it again tonight, Paris, if you wanted. Right, <laughs> you're logging. Well, and just from an equity lens, to make sure that all of our kids have that access, depending whatever's happening in their life, it's a great opportunity. It sounds like it. And there's literacy involved that they can still read. Because like, th that was one thing that we didn't really like with the other two that we piloted. There was no reading um, to do. And I know that you don't like that. <laughs> but they're not that long, OK? But you know, reading, nonfiction reading is important. And it, it, the readings are about how it applies to your everyday life, why this is important. Remember what you did here? This is why it's important, because this is where it shows up later. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh -huh. I would like to, first of all, thank you, Lee, for taking time yeah. out of your schedule tonight to come and speak before us. And I know you're a very passionate teacher. Yeah. Um, we, we got to work together many years ago. Um, I had a question about the, um, about the assessments a little bit. So with this science, I'm assuming there's assessments that are on paper. And then there are there assessments also that are actually the kids like performing the labs. And it so depends. Forth? It depends. Um, like with um, Open Syed, we decided to use a formative for their retest to see because um, they could. I thought it was important that they had to learn from what what they got and then they also got to uh, see what the other students they went around to find out okay well what did you do to if it, if they weren't successful they had ideas but then they'd have to go and talk with other students to see what did they do and maybe they were going to incorporate okay. some of that into their redesign and then retest everybody was way more successful the second time around and they were so excited about it. So that was different than a pen and paper one. Okay. Um, like we're doing a weather one right now, and then their their assessment is going was to look at to make this drawing about how our weather changes, what what occurs to make our weather change, so that they you know not too many times is there a drawing as a as an assessment. So we try to do a little bit different ones because all the kids have different strengths and things. Mm -hmm. And assessment is the fancy term for a test. Yeah, or, or anyone else or, in the room. Yeah, a test yeah, or a quiz. Yeah, 
project. Or a project. Mm -hmm. to, or to prove that evidence of your learning. Yeah, so. correct. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, any other questions or comments? We've got Lee here. Or well, I a, Maggie, when you were talking about assessments, were you talking about assessments? I mean, not necessarily testing, but more like if they're meeting the standards? Yes. So what do, what do those look like? Because, I mean, no, like in elementary school, they have like the star tests, like to see if they're, where they fall. Yeah, so I think those can be anywhere from a, like kind of what we were talking about, like to show for to show what you know. So, and that can look like a standardized test or a cold read where you're having kids read um, something that is science-based and then answering questions on a lab that is similar. A lab can also be an assessment yeah. of um, uh, math Each, each of the problems, lessons, at least like in iQuest, will have the, uh, the standard that this standards that the lesson is meeting so that you know we know exactly why we're doing it for what purpose and then the final and then from a summative standpoint we're at the end to see how our kids did we have the achievement data and we also so that's kind of um, from state tests that's kind of a summative of how our kids did on the standards so for the year state tests for that then? that's a uh, we use formative assessments throughout the year, but that is one indicator, yeah. Oh, yeah. That reminded me, another good thing I really like about iQuest is the writing element, mm -hmm. that the students um, use a CR format to write, and not using data, using data to support why something is the way it is, or are you agreeing with this scientist? Are you disagreeing? And what use the data from the labs that you did in class to support uh, your statements and I just think it's so important for students to be able to communicate in writing mm -hmm. in a um, scientific yeah uh, way yeah, mm -hmm. yeah they're, they're not just this is what I think mm -hmm. but to have evidence to back it up mm -hmm. this is why you should believe me mm -hmm. so it's really cool to see yeah. thank you Leah Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for being here. It's always fun to hear from the science teacher. And you look a little like Miss Frizzle. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> um, I'm going to move into the high school math updates because that's just one more that I just want to highlight. Um, we did a math update. It was, the review was 2021 school year. Um, but there were a couple of books that from kind of what um, Lee was explaining that we didn't need to purchase at that time. And now our license have need to be renewed. So there are four books that um, the high school math uh, curriculum facilitator is requesting. And those are more of the textbooks type things. So um, those are also in um, the board report. So. Um, we're now going to be moving into our character ed review. And I am, um, so if we can move Maria to that. Uh, there we go. We have our character strong curriculum review. And I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, who's going to be um, leading this um, portion of the curriculum review. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I'm pleased to be coming before you to share this curriculum review around our character education curriculum. Um, it is the result of a lot of hard work from our pilot team, as well as the students and staff that participated in the pilot. And it is a personal passion of mine as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so as you already know, um, character education is not new to Greendale Schools. We have a long-standing history of providing character education and all that we do. Just referring you all back to the Greendale attributes, this graphic really highlights the fact that character was at the center of the Greendale attributes and continues to be part of our practices. It really supported um, students with the skills they needed to be able to communicate and collaborate in the classroom and beyond, as well as being 
citizens, global citizens in the school environment and as part of the world, as well as being critical thinkers and creative thinkers. So we're continuing in that tradition with character education. I've already said it's not a change in practice, but what the Character Strong curriculum will do is it will provide a toolkit for teachers to be able to pull resources from and use in their classrooms. Next slide. Next slide, please. That was a transition slide. I am going to have to read from my own um, screen because I cannot see that um, that far away. So basically, we wanted to just ground us in what do we mean when we talk about character education and social emotional learning. So for character education, we mean it is that learning process used for students to understand, care about, and act on certain character values. And the Character Strong curriculum highlights at that elementary level 10 character traits that they really focus on and weave throughout the entire curriculum. And then when we talk about social emotional learning, we're really referring to that process of students understanding their emotions, being able to manage their own emotions, and then use them in different social situations and social context. So Character Strong really works to weave both character education and social emotional learning into the curriculum, the one curriculum. Why does it matter? Um, a number of reasons why it matters. So one is around those protective factors, making sure the students, um, as we're working with their, them, we're building them up so that they can sustain and be resilient when they may encounter or have to cope with things like mental health challenges or even it could be navigating a conflict in the classroom or in the school environment. We wanna build them up with the skills they need to do those things. Research has long yielded that having a strong character education curriculum, teaching, as well as a social emotional learning results in increased achievement when it comes to reading and math, as well as leading to increased rates of high school graduation. And then finally, this is just one other um, benefit of character education and social emotional learning is that we know it supports and our employers are looking for our students to come with not only strong character, but a high emotional IQ or emotional intelligence where they can navigate situations that may come up in college, career, or life, um, as well as we know those are skills that students need every day in school. Next slide, please. Um, Ms. Olson talked a lot about standards alignment as part of the curriculum review and one of the things we want to make sure we have in any curriculum we, b we bring before you all but then that we're using in our schools. So two points I want to just highlight here. One is that um, the inner ring highlights the fact that Character Strong is aligned to CASEL which is a national framework for character education. And then on the outer ring, you see that it's aligned to our social emotional learning competencies from the state. Um, so just like we have academic standards, we have standards that we want our students to be able to meet when it comes to character development or social emotional learning. And those are the ones on that outer ring. So things like self-awareness. We talked earlier about knowing how to identify your emotions, knowing how to manage them. Social awareness. So being able to read those different social environments, social cues, and navigate them. Relationship building, um, so we know that that's key. If students are in the classroom, they need to be able to work with each other. They need to be able to work with adults. They need to be able to work with people out in the community. So relationship building is another one of those social emotional learning competencies. And then the other two are really around self-management, so that weaves in managing your own emotions, but then things like Time management, executive functioning, being able to really prioritize what do I do first and second um, if you're maybe having to juggle different responsibilities. And then the last one is around responsible decision making. So we just wanted to highlight that Character Strong is aligned to the CASEL um, national framework as well as our state competencies. Next slide. You can move ahead to the next one too. Thank you right there is perfect. Um, Ms. Olson also talked about what that review process looks like at a high level. Um, this is what it looks like when we 
dug into a curriculum for character education. So back in 2018, 2019, we had staff work with the Castle representative, and that was really around be building their knowledge around social emotional learning, character education, the competencies, so that foundational knowledge that they needed. And then in 2019, 2020, we had them go through a needs assessment. So what do we actually need in our district to be able to identify the appropriate curriculum? That rolled into 2021 school year where they dug into um, the research and different curriculums out there, continuing into this year where we really zeroed in on two curriculums, Character Strong and Second Step. And we piloted, um, as I shared with you all previously, when I gave the scorecard update, we piloted those two curriculums at the K-8 level, and then at the high school level, we piloted Character Strong. So that was a lead up to where we are today. Next slide. Okay, um, just want to highlight why Character Strong. So why did we settle on this? Uh, we already talked about the lead up and the research that was conducted. The last part of this slide really um, hits home around why we settled on Character Strong. So number one, it is student focused and is very engaging in comparison to Second Step. And we will share some teacher voice around what they felt like the pilot, how they felt like the pilot went, and how it was beneficial to their students in a, in the coming slides. We've already shared that it's aligned to CASO, that national framework, as well as our statewide competencies. And then this one is huge. It really leads to the ease of implementation for teachers. So um, the activities are developmentally appropriate at each grade level, which allows for vertical alignment. So we don't have students being exposed to maybe the same content over and over. Uh, Character Strong will allow us to have something that's unique at each grade. And then the prep for the teachers is minimal. So the curriculum is all online with appropriate professional development. It will require very little prep for the teachers. And then they will have that toolkit I don't know what's going on with my mic here, so excuse me there. Um, they would have that toolkit where they can pull the resources and the activities that they want. But there is some predictability in it. So every lesson has the same steps. So teachers don't have to kind of do a lot of prep. They know what's coming as they're teaching those lessons. And then one other thing is that there's this holistic mindset around Character Strong and that the approach allows for resources for families to use at home if they need to kind of help support some character development or help students navigate certain situations. There are resources for um, out on the playground, resources for the lunchroom. So it's really a comprehensive curriculum and that anybody can really take resources and activities for different settings. Next slide. And we have a quote here from a teacher, um, which I would like to share, and then one video to elevate that teacher voice. So this is from Kate Searing, uh, one of our kindergarten teachers over at College Park. She said, we have always seen a need for social emotional work in kindergarten. But coming off of the pandemic, we are experiencing it much more. This year, we spent a lot of time in my classroom recognizing the big feelings that come along with learning how to work with peers, managing big feelings, solving problems, and recognizing that choices affect others and may have con consequences. So she goes on to allude to and talk about how um, the curriculum Character Strong would help her to address some of these things that she's seeing in her classroom. Next slide. Um, and then this will allow for Ms. Wickland to actually share her own voice around Character Strong and what that looks like in her classroom. Hi, my name is Leah Wickland. I teach fifth grade at College Park, and I had the opportunity this year to pilot Character Strong. Um, I was really impressed with the program. I thought it gave a lot of tangible, um, easy things to implement for teachers um, that were impactful for our students. Um, the two um, 
months that we piloted, we focused around kindness and empathy. And I feel like those are words that we often use with kids, but through Character Strong, we were able to really develop a strong definition and strong understanding of what kindness and empathy are, what does it look like, and how can we apply it to our everyday life. Um, some things that I really liked about Character Strong was that there was a range of activities for the kids to engage with. And so um, it allowed to touch on different types of learning styles for kids. Like, you know, some kids really connected with journaling. Um, some kids really connected with videos and songs. Some kids really connected with different games and activities. So it allowed each kid to tap into um, different activities and the word of the month to really um, center themselves and get out of it what they needed to get out of it. Um, Character Strong, you know, really does a nice job of teaching things at a developmentally appropriate level. So for fifth grade, um, I felt like it was engaging for the students. They were excited every day to um, complete their Character Strong lesson. But more importantly, I didn't feel like it just, we did a lesson and the kids moved on from it. You know, today is June and I still have students referencing lessons, activities, videos, quotes that we did while we piloted this program all the way through the entire year. So I feel like that really um, explains and showcases the impact of Character Strong that kids are still referencing months later um, these lessons that we did. <laughs> Next slide, please. We appreciate uh, Ms. Wicklin for not only piloting the curriculum, but then obviously sharing in her own voice the benefit and the impact on her classroom. One more. Thank you. Okay, and then this is the final voice that we'll share tonight, and this is from a eighth grade an eighth grade teacher, Bridget Brown, at our middle school. A character education program with outlined specific goals will help our schools teach our students to be self-aware, motivated learners. It will provide our students and staff with common language to address emotions and behaviors. When implemented with fidelity across the grade levels, we will see an increase in our students' abilities to manage stress, maintain positive relationships, and learn to talk about emotions in a healthy and productive way. So we thank her again for piloting as well. And then if you could advance one more slide. So with that, what we will leave you with is our final recommendation, and I believe that this will be coming um, back to the board on the 20th for approval. So at the K-4 level, they're currently using We Thinkers, and we recommend after going through um, some discussion with that staff that they continue to use We Thinkers. However, they will have access to Purposeful People, which is actually character strong, and that's another um, highlight of the program. They understand that at the elementary level, we want to call it and kind of brand it a little different, even though those traits weave through, because we know as we get our students are older and they matriculate through the school system. So at that middle and high school level, it cannot look like it looked at the elementary level. But Purposeful People is actually character strong. So they'll have access to the curriculum as a supplement. And then we're looking to move forward with character strong at the K-5 through 8th grade level. We recognize that there was a flaw in the pilot at the high school level, so we're looking to repilot Character Strong at the appropriate grade level for ninth and 10th grade. And then for 11th and 12th, during semester one, there will be some supplementary um, activities available through Character Strong. And then at second semester, our goal would be to identify and pilot a second curriculum so we will have a split pilot at the high school level so this is the recommendation um, if you have any questions we can entertain those now um, and you will have an opportunity to approve this um, if you choose on the Ju at the june 20th meeting okay any uh, questions or thoughts on this 
Thank, thank you. That was it. Was nice to hear from Miss Ledes Ledesma. Led yes, Ledesma. Mrs. Ledesma. Mrs. Thank Ledesma. you. <laughs> um, I just had a few questions. The sources of strength does that come under the SEL curriculum? That's a great question. So we think about sources of strength as one of our universal support. So it wouldn't necessarily come as part of this curriculum, but it would be part of our multi-level systems of support when we think about character education, mental health support within our school would be part of that tier one, but different. Okay. And because the sources of strength, we had a big presentation on sources of strength a little while back, right? And was that, is that also K-5-8? Sources, sources of strength. that just strength. middle school? Okay. Sources of strength is 6-12. 6 12. So, 6 12. Okay. Um, it is up and running fully at 9-12, and we will be able to do, be at the same level with our middle school next year. Okay. Sources of Strength is really a peer leader group, so it is a co-curricular activity for those peer leaders who then uh, per perform service within the school by um, offering sure, coaching and support. Okay. So it's not a curriculum taught by teachers, but it is used in our school. It has a presence. It has a presence. What's in Sources of Strength? Isn't it more of like for suicide prevention? And That's the origins of it, but it's founded on going upstream and providing hope, help, and strength to students um, and providing strategies for them to respond to challenging circumstances in their lives. And then um, I think uh, we've, we heard, again, I'm just echoing some comments I remember from the podium. When, are, when, are, when would Character Strong be taught in the, you know, in the school day? Mm -hmm. From the K-5 to 8, and then also, um, the po I'm assuming it's that advisory period that's been debated for a while now. Um, Correct. So, you know, currently we already have morning meeting time at the elementary school level. So this would be a resource for teachers to pull strategies, activities, make that time a little easier for them. So this would be embedded into the morning meeting time. At the middle school level would be resource, and then at the high school level, um, advisory. Okay. So I have a question with the elementary. I know they've always had like morning circle time. So with this program, is it going to be encouraged that they utilize this certain number of lessons like throughout their month? Are they going to have like, when I was looking at the curriculum online, it was like a word. I mean, there's a lot of words. There was, you know, empathy and kindness and leadership. I mean, are we going to take like a word a month and then? Yeah, there's some work that's good. So this summer we're doing some professional development around um, what this curriculum looks like. So they're all getting four hours of professional development on Character Strong. And then they're going to have an hour as a team of a grade level team to talk about how they're going to infuse it into their current practice. Well, and then what about, I know there are some other options and they're not only for the classroom, but there's like for playground and like lunchroom. Um, I know, at least at the elementary schools, like the playground time is a very difficult time. Lunchroom is mm -hmm. a difficult time. So are, are we going to be doing some training with whatever lunchroom help and outside recess help that we are able to hire? Absolutely. So we use these tools because um, I, I think it would be very beneficial. I 100% agree, and that's one of the reasons why we looked at Character Strong, because it's not just a uh, um, curriculum that is given to kids classroom. in a classroom. It's a school-wide curriculum, and I think that's really important. And what was in place before? We were using... Um, the culturally responsive classrooms, which is like morning meeting and things like that. Um, and also, we were using PBIS and the culture teams to create curriculum um, for this. And then there was also the attributes of a Greendale graduate, which was kind of grounded in the work we did. It evolved since 2010. It's evolved a couple of times. And it started with CARE, which was developed by counselors for teachers to use within the morning meeting. And that was self-developed. So um, a lot of our previous curriculums have been self-developed, self-created, and uh, had a self-delivered <laughs> a looser research sure. base than the curriculums that have been reviewed in this cycle okay so Good will on. like pbis kind of go by the wayside then and i mean no no that will still be there and the golden paw that they have there's a lot of this is all to go in concert together okay. um really trying to ensure that our our universal that means like everybody gets um some really significant like 
clear um, messages messages and um, tools that are aligned to the different standards that DPI is asking us to teach kids but we also know is really helpful um, especially with um, what's happening in our world right now mm -hmm. and it gives everyone a common language and absolutely yeah it's hard to argue with the end of that last quote you know to have something in place to help uh, students deal with stress build positive relationships, um, learn how to talk about their emotions in healthy ways. I mean, we all, we all need those things, right? So, so do our students. A comment I wanted to make was um, this character strong. I, I actually happen to use it in my own classroom, and um, I have found it to be, um, one of the teachers even said it, it, you're not just trying to think up curriculum, but there's actually kind of a scope and sequence. And I, I believe a couple parents way back in some meetings we had earlier in the year were concerned about this time, you know, being fluff time per se or, or not really focused. But Character Strong really does have a strong message, and I think that's the key part of the strong in there is that um, it carries through. And um, to your point, uh, Tasha, I, I know schools like my own are using each month as a theme to, to focus on. And I think one of the teachers talked about it, kindness and empathy. Um, so I think it's really important to get that common language for our students. And I don't know if we, um, well, d none of our student board members have had the pilot, have they? Or if you guys had the pilot yeah so my class did the 24 okay that was what they call like the error in the piloting because we actually had the ninth grade curriculum oh. and so I honestly think that it set off our entire class because I think as soon as it started we heard really negative feedback from my peers okay. and so I think that if this continued my class personally might not have such a great impact as the middle school or other people are having so do I think next year with the freshmen when they do it or the incoming freshmen when they do it, I think sure it could be them impactful, but I know my class is like kind of now set They already have a negative view of Yeah, it. I think every, anytime it was brought up, I think I heard almost every single person like moan or like complain about it. Oh, we're doing um, this again. Yeah, I just, I think also it depends on the age group you're targeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think in middle school and elementary school, it's easier to start those habits of talking about emotions but when once you're reaching like high school level it's really hard mm -hmm. to make that yes to make that the new normal so we were also not really like, giving 100 percent of ourselves into the program because it wasn't normal it was weird for all of sure. us to do this that's really good feedback that is that is really well and i just want to highlight that's why 9 through 12 isn't just adopting character strong from that student voice um, that Kai is sharing right now. That's why we're looking. That's why it doesn't look like K5 through 12. Everyone's adopting character strong. That is why we're kind of continuing a pilot and doing a readjustment and then also possibly piloting a different one to get different feedback. I think that the beginning that we do, like the games they have, all of us would participate in the games because it's a game and I don't remember the last time any of my classmates played a game in school. <laughs> right, yeah. So that, that was, was nice. appealing. Yes, that was yeah. very, and we got to know each other because advisory is also not just your friends and like you don't pick your advisory, it's a bunch of random kids put together. Mm -hmm. So that was a good icebreaker, which I think was one of the goals of Character Strong. So I think that hit its benchmark, but everything after felt scripted. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe if not necessarily deviated from the program of it, but maybe put it into a different slideshow or put in the little extra effort from like separate for the teachers. So it would be more work on the adults like part, but I mm -hmm. think it would be a good change because I don't think people would realize it's actually character strong in the first place too. Sure. So amend it a little bit, green delize it a little bit. Yeah. Um, adding on to uh, what Kaya said about the, uh, the usage of the advisory period. Um, I know for me in Paris is a, uh, board presentation, we talked about the use of the flex time, which was kind of like a resource you could use during your advisory period. And I, I really do like the idea that's uh, being proposed here. But um, would, like, by implementing this, would this remove that flex time from the schedule at all? And, like, would that still kind of be able to be implemented? Because I know from a lot of talking to a lot of my friends and a lot of my peers, a lot of people really liked that flex time just because having a built-in study hall to your day is a really appealing thing that a lot of different people could use. Wes, thanks for that question. That's a really important question. No, it wouldn't. Um, flex time is something that has been really popular and actually really helpful for kids who need that reteaching and need that extra support or need time for them to uh, meet with teachers. So that will continue. This is um, to support um, those other times when we have um, advisory time 
that isn't dedicated to flex or ACP because there's only so many ACP classes as well. All right. Well, I, I really like this proposal then because I think what a lot of the problem that people had with advisory at the beginning of the year was it was kind of all towards the uh, the curriculum being presented to us in advisory. And I think a lot of that curriculum was good, but I think a problem was a lot of people got bored. So I think by like allowing that flex time and also implementing the curriculum there, uh, here and there, I think it's a really good medium. And I think it'll It'll like it'll allow you to have that SEL aspect, but it'll also allow kids to not get bored, which I think is a really good idea. Yeah. We do appreciate that feedback, and it, it is echoing some of what we've already heard. So we know that we need to get that balance right for high school. It looks a little different there, so that's why we're taking the extra time to do that. I appreciate the cross section that you you know they had a few staff members from different grade levels touch base. I didn't want to put Miss Burrish on the spot, but if there's anything you have to add about character strong, that I actually didn't pilot. I had the second step in my classroom. Okay, okay. So, all right. Um, any other uh, thoughts or questions? This was very thorough, and I know there's a lot of work that goes into this. This was not just a roll the dice and pick a curriculum, but um, there's a lot of work. So I thank the staff that also piloted, the students, obviously, for, for them trying this out. And I think it's, it's going to be good things for the district. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, we are going to move on to agenda item 11, which is our open enrollment seats for 2022 and 23. No, that's not on the agenda. It's not. Nope. Oops. What am I looking at? Uh, we're into policies, right? I have the agenda wrong agenda. Item 11. No wonder why I'm off tonight. Okay. Um, so we are on to policies, first reading. <laughs> The policy committee met uh, in May, and we reviewed uh, four policies. Only three of them are being brought forward for first reading, and I'll explain that in a minute. So the first one is school admissions. There are no recommended changes here. This was a policy that was established in 2018 as part of the WASB uh, review of policies, and it was recommended that we have one in place. It is used to help us um, place students in the appropriate grade levels and is part of policy that's required as we count our students. It is uh, working. There are no uh, changes recommended there. The second policy is open enrollment. Um, this policy was also revised in 2018 or 2019, and there were quite a few uh, significant changes because of law changes at that time. And it is a strong, the policy was in a good spot, but there were recommended changes coming from the policy committee around months um, because the state law dictates the months that certain things happen. So you have to approve open seats in January. You can't um, do certain things until June. Um, and what was recommended by the policy committee is given that the law changed pretty substantially and the timelines were such an issue in there that we word it in a way that we change it from January to the month before applications open so that there is some give and it wouldn't need to be immediately um, reviewed if there was a law change on it. So those changes are really um, just about generalizing the timeline rather than naming specific months. Do we have other districts that we looked at their open enrollment? Um, like, how does this compare to, or would WASB, anything? Yeah, this was written with legal counsel assistance at the time of the law change. I mean, it seems pretty technical. and I, It is I very technical. Um, it is critical that this policy be right because it's what you, what's used for appeals on open enrollment applications. Sure. Okay. And then the third policy that uh, we are bringing forward is a new policy that's being recommended. And it is a policy that focuses on uh, situations in which um, a student has multiple households in which people have rights uh, to their uh, educational records, to decision making around their education, and to um, their placement within their homes. There is law on this. and. Uh, before now we've been following the law on this but what this policy does is it clarifies the responsibilities of who brings us the information that in the absence of docu legal documentation how will we behave and in the presence of legal documentation how will we behave uh, this came from a sample policy through WASB um, and uh, 
is tightly aligned to uh, policies that have been reviewed in other districts. I'd like to comment. I uh, talked to you this afternoon, Dr. Midzik. I think this is a very important policy, having gone through this myself, um, for parents, especially when they're sharing placement with students, to feel that they have accessibility to their student, student staff and so forth. Um, I know the one question I had was that there will be um, a person listed as a primary contact. And we talked about this, but I wanted to clarify for anyone who might be listening is that um, both parents, if there's a shared placement, will have that opportunity to be contacted by the district, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I would like like to highlight as well. I yeah, this this I was surprised. This, I mean, it's 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 an excellent it's an excellent policy to have in place. Um, but just as a general, it, it, for anyone who hasn't read it yet, the school district should be aware of um, any court orders in place regarding you know legal custody. But most parents have joint legal custody, which means they have access to all school records and their children and conferences and all those things. But if there's a dispute, which is, you know, you know, can happen from time to time, obviously, it's the police, it's the job of the police department to enforce court orders, not the school district. Correct. And then a policy that was discussed at the policy committee meeting um, but is not being brought forward because there is some there was some discussion there that needs to be go back to the policy committee before we bring that forward for a first reading. Uh, there was discussion about adding a social media policy, but there are we needed to uh, go back and look at our staff use of technology policy and the handbook to make sure that we did that we indeed needed a separate policy because we might not we might need it might already be partially in drafted within the staff use of technology policy. And so anything where the policy committee wants to crosswalk and determine if, if um, there's additional components that need to be in the staff acceptable use of technology policy, then we would um, we would bring that back Align to the board. Yeah, yeah, I think we talked about aligning. So any, I know that there was a public comment regarding this. So we're talking about policy 522.7. Um, so if anyone wants to read that uh, before the next board meeting, specifically um, sections D and E, uh, social media guidelines. Obviously, social media is change, changes so rapidly, so this policy does need to be updated. Um, but the policy committee uh, wanted to look at the policy in place, the use of technology policy in place, and then the staff handbook, and make sure that we're aligning all three. Um, as a general rule, I'm sure most people who are employed know that you do have to be careful uh, regarding your use of social media um, as if you're working for any employer, but in particular school districts dealing with students. So um, so anyway, this sounds like it'll be a... a yeah, the, the policy, policy committee to needed to take a, another look at it before we brought it bo forward for the full board to review. So that is why it's not in the first readings, but it was on the policy agenda. So there, let me clarify then, there, there is potentially a, a separate policy we're looking at or... I think what the policy committee said is they're not sure that they want this separate policy. They want to crosswalk it and not propose a new policy. So that was the initial consideration on the policy committee um, meeting, but they, we needed to pull back a little and do additional review before we brought it forward to the full board. Okay. Yeah, there's because there's three different places that use of social media is... Right. is right. Um, is out there and we want to make sure that we're reviewing all three of those places and aligning them. Make sure they're the same. Yep. Or, um, the other question I was going to ask is with WASB, I'm assuming we're, we're reaching out to them to get some feedback and potentially looking at other districts as well? Yes, the, the potential for a new policy came from a WASB request for that type of policy, um, but we had embedded it we had embedded parts of that sample policy in, in the staff acceptable use of technology policy so there's a little bit more that we want to go back and ask some questions on and review on policy I only bring it up because there was citizen comment and uh, it was on the policy committee agenda so it is not here it's not for the board to take a first reading on yet uh, but I wanted to let you know that there was conversation about that possibility 
in the policy committee meeting and um, they will be taking a look at that again at the next policy meeting for consideration for a recommendation at which the, is in July in July right? it was in July 10th Correct. I think or something so a perfect time to review social media during the summer <laughs> <laughs> So I appreciate it, and I do appreciate the citizen comment tonight. Um, I think the intent here in no way is going to be to stifle the voice of educators, but to just make sure we're in line with um, appropriate use and making sure that um, that we follow our, our, like our technology policies that we have in place is what I'm hearing. Okay. All right. Any other questions or thoughts on that uh, or any of the policies that we just reviewed? All right, then we are going on to agenda item, I want to make sure I do this right, number 12, uh, the review of the board meeting dates and calendar of reports for 2022 and 2023. Yes, yeah, so um, what the calendar of reports does is it sets in place the board considers what is it that they want to um, bring forward and uh, discuss at their board meetings. Of course, things can be added to the agenda as issues arise, as we did many a time during um, the pandemic. And um, things, but this is a general outline of here's what we is important and here's the timeline of um, meetings so that this can be communicated to the public and they have advance notice as to what's coming uh, forward. So the calendar of reports is presented for consideration for your review, and then it will be brought forward for approval at the uh, June 20th meeting. One modification that came out um, after it was drafted for the board's consideration on, in the packet was that the safety plan update was um, misplaced in October. And October is when they do the safety walkthroughs with the police department and the fire department. So they won't be able to bring that forward until the November meeting. Um, and so it's recommended that that one be moved to a November meeting. You, uh, say, is that the October 4th? October 3rd, there's a safety plan update listed and uh, that one may need to be moved to November. Okay. And I'd like to um, add that the next policy committee meeting is on this calendar um, and it's <laughs> yes, July 18th, so we, Right, we do put it on there. Um, typically, we only have one meeting in July and in this calendar of reports, I'm recommending that we simply hold uh, that July 18th following the policy committee meeting as a potential meeting, but that if there's no need to come together around personnel that we would not okay. um, meet in the month of July. Um, the second space that I made an adjustment from the first and third Mondays is in the month of August. Typically, we would meet two times in August and two times in September. What that would do is would put us at back-to-back -back meetings on September 12th and September 19th. So I suggest that we move the August 15th meeting back to August 29th and only meet once between August 1st and September 19th. Uh, it gives you regularly scheduled meetings and the business that is on the calendar of reports is um, doable within the timelines that are there. And then uh, the other spot that I made an adjustment was uh, there is only a work session listed for December. And the December meeting is not included. Uh, typically, when we have our second meeting of the month in December, we are overlapping concerts all over the place. And I would suggest that we not meet and allow board members to attend uh, concerts for the schools that they liaison. I would agree. Sounds great. Yeah. yeah. I had a question. I was looking back at the 21, 22, um, just a couple highlights I made. Um, we, we typically, or I think we have typically gone over the learning plan in August. Um, it's not, I don't see. Once it. we did that. Oh, we did. Uh, and that was because it was a COVID learning plan. Okay, okay. I was, <laughs> I was just trying to see if that was anything yep. specific. Um, and so I don't think we're going to need to do that next year. Okay, all right. And then um, I'm just trying to see. The, the annual meeting is on September 19th. The annual meeting is on, is on September 19th. That was set at the annual meeting last year as required by policy. And then I was also going to mention um, we had an approval of an MOU for mental health services. Uh, was that also pandemic related? Or? No, the MOU for mental health services is a, a longer contract, so it does not need to be reviewed okay. annually. What is the term of that contract, three or five years? Uh, 
I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure, but that was for the clinic at our high school through Catamaran Counseling. So that's what that MOU was for. I can look it up quickly and get right back to you. Okay. If you sure, or we it. can have it and adjust if we need to for the okay. calendar of reports and the update and the approval timeline in June. And I did make a couple other highlights. Um, the district enrollment update in October, I, I see that that's not part of our 22-23. Is that uh, something that we want to be doing? It will be embedded in the uh, budget work and the open enrollment um information on January 9th. Okay. So you are looking at enrollments, the enrollment reports, to start to plan for budgeting and open enrollment. And so um, we felt that it was helpful to just partner that with the open enrollment and um, make that information come together simultaneously. OK. All right. I'm a nerd for this, so if anybody wants to interject well, only, anything. <laughs> the question I had was, there's a date, like February 20th. I think, is that the is that overlap with like the four-day? I think we ha were schools out that Friday and that Monday. It, it, it does overlap. So school is, um, there's no student attendance on the 17th, and then there's no student attendance on the 20th. One of those two days is professional development. Um, and it has typically been on a day when we don't have student attendance. It used to be a Monday, Tuesday, which was harder. Um, so if there are, if there's an interest in moving that meeting, we would be open to that. But moving it back a week would put you really close to March 6th. Uh, and moving it up a week would only put one week between meetings. So we could make some alterations to that. Are you thinking like in terms of family trips? Yeah, because like <laughs> with kids, like then that's like, that's prime time. That's prime no time somewhere. to travel, yep. so, right? Well, so that is a thought. I don't, yeah. Unless you want a virtual in from wherever you are. Yep. <laughs> or you can, it's okay to miss a meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, so Meetings at 7 and school yep. starts at 7 a.m. the next day, so. There you go. <laughs> Some people might be on a flight, though. I like how you have these, it's Panther Pride, is that new? That's new? Uh, no, we've done the presentations. I just had Maybe last like year. moved them to the front oh, of the meeting. Okay. Okay, I like that oh, yeah. too. I think that's important to uh, respect the time of those coming in that we put them at the front of the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so I was looking at last year's November 15th. We had a preliminary enrollment in staffing. Um, I don't see that on here anywhere. Um, so do we, are we going to have some sort of, because I know Julie, you usually give us a report on that. That's the piece um, similar to enrollment that would come up as part of the budget updates, okay. um, as well as open enrollment as we're looking at the number of sections that will be required for the following year. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, the Perkins grant, I th was that a just a this year thing, or is that something that will that was in January of 2022? It is on here for January 23rd, action approved 6603 agreement, Perkins grant. There it is. Yep. Okay, sorry, I missed that one. And then the risk management report on the 24th of January. Who's back there? Is that, that's not the same as the, that's not the same as the safety report. No. Nope. That reports provided every other year. Okay. Okay. Which at the bottom you can see there's notes on rotating reports and so the risk management report is listed again for the 23-24 school year. Okay. Where is that located? At the very bottom. There's uh, rotating reports listed. On the bottom of the fourth page. Fourth page. Gotcha. Okay, there it is. Thank you. All right. Uh, I don't think I had anything else. Um, anybody else have anything? No. Thank you for comparing both. Yeah, I was early. just looking through them. I, and I, I do like that we're streamlining some of this because I think there is redundancy in our meetings, and I you know, think that we need to condense where we're going with some of this. Okay. All right. So seeing no more... No more questions or anything? We will bring that back to the June 20th meeting for approval. Okay. And then next up is uh, agenda item 13, and that is CESA 1 contract. So we partner with CESA for a number of services, and the board uh, approves that contract with CESA um, for those services, and they are outlined here. 
um, the most most of the services uh, revolve around interactions and meetings um, for uh, job alike pieces. So when you ask, have we consulted? Have we talked with other districts? Have we taken a look at what other districts are doing? CESA provides an avenue for us to engage with uh, professionals across the region uh, who have similar areas. And so that is part of the network that we build through CESA and connect with uh, people from other districts on how are you doing this? What does this look like? What is How are you uh, navigating this? So it is professional development, uh, mostly for administrators and some of the um, areas. There is one thing that's uh, quite expensive, and we do contract through CESA for some specific special education programming for specific students. So if you open that that sheet that's in there, it provides you with information on specifically what services we are contracting for next year through CESA. Uh, the two most significant are around um, hearing and uh, two student placements, uh, alternative placements for students with special needs. Okay. Everyone see that? Any questions? We call that turning point, correct? Turning point is the name of the alternative school placement. Okay. Okay. I think we're good on that, right? All right. We are at the second comments uh, and questions from visitors. So I would like to see if anybody has any comments or questions. Good evening, Kim. Sorry, I'm texting my child. He gets off work, I think, in like 15 minutes. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Um, first of all, um, a couple of things. Oh, Paris, I'm going to miss you. I'm not going to cry. Uh, <laughs> I love that girl. I do. I love her. Um, would you mind? I, I know that I said your name, but would you mind? Oh, I'm sorry. Mrs. K. Greendale. <laughs> um, just, she knows. Uh, Kaya Fuentes. Oh, girl, look at you. No, I'm so proud of you. She's a college park. I'm, you know, my college park kids. They all know me. A um, couple of things. Uh, when it comes to the social media that you guys talk about with the teachers, um, with everything that's going on in this country right now, I think when teachers post on social media, uh, students today do know how to find teachers, Facebook pages, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, whatever it is that they're doing. I, I think that uh, the political view of teachers needs to stay out of the school. It's, it's something that does not need to be brought up into the school. Political issues, um, certain uh, guidelines that are happening in the, in the world right now as far as like LGBTQ, all that kind of thing, BLM, whatever it is, those are discussions that need to be discussed in the privacy of the home. It is not the school district's responsibility to talk about that with ch children. Kids are already confused enough with the two years that they are behind with the masking. Um, again, I hope and pray to God that this district doesn't go back to ever doing masking. I don't think it's uh, detrimental to their learning. We all know that COVID isn't going anywhere. It is here to stay, whether or not you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. We all know that there are breakthrough cases. Um, me working in the medical field, um, I do know that uh, people who have been vaccinated one, two, three, four times, they're still coming into the hospital, they're still sick, they're not as sick, but it's nothing that's gonna be going away. Um, I wanna know what this district is going to do as far as children who are now two years behind. Um, I know that summer school is gonna be at full time. My son has to go to summer school, but there are certain classes that are not offered in summer school, and especially at the high school level, I do know that there are certain classes I think that should be, especially math. I know that there's an English and there's a history, but there was no math, and I know that um, my child is failing math, unfortunately, and he's gonna have to make that up either next year or on the back end of his senior year of high school. So I just hope that you all take that into consideration when you make these decisions about social media, about how we're gonna go forward with um, kids who are in IEP and kids who, are, who have fallen behind these two years during the COVID time. So I hope that you take that all into consideration when you make your final decisions. Perfect. Thank you for sharing tonight. Thank you, Kim. Any other comments or questions from visitors tonight? 
All right, seeing none, we are at the end of our agenda. Our next meeting is scheduled for June 20th at 7 o'clock, so we hope to see you here. And thank you, everyone.